you very much to everybody for a comment. This is GoGN, it's our series of webinars that, that happens every Wednesday, every first Wednesday of, of every month. And um, today we're very, very, very happy. I'm I'm super happy actually to have with, with us uh, Penny Bentley. So Penny is one of our PhD students and uh, PhD researchers, and uh, she's gonna uh, she's gonna give them well, she's gonna talk about the research that she's that she's been doing for the last uh, for the last few months, even years, I suppose. Um, so mm -hmm. it's all about uh, teachers, teachers, and Penny is based in Australia, so. Um, delighted to have her. Delighted, like, um, I don't know, she's going to share so much with us. And I, I'll be keeping an eye on the blog. Uh, so, um, write your questions on the window. If, if, if you have questions, uh, we might take some. Penny, I'll leave it up to you if you want to leave it up questions during the chat, during the, the presentation. If not, we'll wait. We'll wait. It's my connection, and it's my hopefully will be fine. We'll wait until the end of the presentation for the take question. So take it away. Thank you, Pete. No, I've um I've lost you a couple of times in the last few minutes. So I'm just wondering whether it's my the connection at my end or or at your end. So um we'll see how we go. And thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, and hi everybody, thank you. Thank you all so much for coming along tonight. It's a bit after 9pm in the evening um, at the moment and um, a nice cold Melbourne day today. Uh, I, I, I can't say that I'm an expert. I think we're all, we're all an expert in a way in our, in our own fields and I think the more I learn, the more I realise that there's a lot that's common to what we to what we're doing, and um, it's great that we can support each other in this way, and especially from all around the globe. Uh, now, when I when B said to me, um, "You can do a, a presentation about your PhD," and then I asked B, "Well, what?" what do I say, what, what goes on to this presentation, B was, was great. She said, look, it's flexible. You can tell us about your journey, you can tell us about your PhD, you can do this, this and this. So, so that was really, really comforting to know. But actually when I sat down to try and do it, I realised after, after a few days that I was trying to get my 80,000 word PhD thesis onto PowerPoint presentation, so it was going to be death by PowerPoint very quickly if I didn't do something about it. And I still think it might be death by PowerPoint because there's so much to put on it. Um, I began my PhD in 2014 and I'm in the process of writing up my thesis now and I'm supposed to be submitting towards the end of the year. Um, I may have to press pause for a while, I, I just don't know, we'll, we'll see how we go. So there's, there's so much that I could say, um, yet so much that I still have to learn. So bear with me if I sound a bit tongue-tied tongue because this is the first time I've actually spoken about my PhD to anyone outside of my university and my supervisors. So it's a great opportunity for me to do this and that's one of the benefits of belonging to this network. Um, so. The original title, a title of this was um, the title of my PhD, Australian Teachers' Experience of Professional Learning Through Open Education. But I began to realise that it's more about thoughts about the PhD experience. So it, my presentation will sort of move between my thoughts and experiences and what I'm actually trying to, to do with my PhD. So. Now, really, on so many levels, this journey has been one of perspective change. Um, on so many levels, and I just love love this image because it, it says a lot about 
about perspective change. You had this dear, dear lady who was probably sitting down having a lovely relaxing cup of tea with probably with her feet up and then the, so the cup of tea meant relaxation and pleasure to her but then, then she had a closer look at the water in that cup of tea and then realised what was in that cup of tea. So the meaning of it changed in an instant for her because her experience changed. And so that's what's happened to me a lot on many occasions along the way and that's the kind of thing I'm looking for with the teachers that I've interviewed and worked with throughout this study. So uh, throughout this presentation too, I've, I've tried to put in some treasures from the public domain um, in here because that's one of the great pleasures I've had from doing this PhD as well as hunting around for all those goodies on, on the um, archive.org. It's just a treasure trove and that's why I'm taking so long to do my PhD I think is because I'm getting so distracted by all the wonderful things that I'm finding. Uh, just a bit of, uh, a bit of context um, about my study. Um, it's about Australian teachers, K-12 teachers and uh, over here in Australia and, and I I believe it's it's like this in many places around the world is that teacher, teachers are facing a culture of uh, reform and, and standardisation of their, their skills and knowledge and accountability you know that, that's talked about in, in the literature as a culture of compliance rather than a culture of professional learning and it so we have, teachers have pressure from the international tests. Um, we also have national tests across Australia for numeracy and literacy. And those national tests are then published, uh, put out there in the public on a website so that parents can see which schools um, have students with the, the highest tests. And, and so there's, there's a lot of accountability, feelings of accountability and pressure that teachers are experiencing. And Jenny, you've got the same thing in um, Canada as well. Yeah. So we have that and, and in addition to that, there's declining interest. Um, there has been for 20 years or so, interest in participation in those, in the maths and science subjects um, related to STEM education. So when I talk about STEM, I mean science, technology, mathematics and engineering but in in the majority of schools in Australia uh, STEM is is not a separate subject area it's approached in a, in a cross-disciplinary manner um, uh, across across subjects but maths and science are, are still taught as separate domains in in most schools I think so really there's there's this there's this feeling or the, this perception of crisis um, and blame. Then you, you look in, you turn on the news, um, and so often there's there's another story about another school or another child, and how teachers have done this, and results have done that, and so on. So, um, and and also the rhetoric in a lot of the documents and um, media is of quality teachers. So we need to improve the quality of teachers and the quality of their teaching, and um, even though those terms quality are not really defined, no one really knows what quality means unless it just means that their students get the high, high marks and, and um, learn more in, in terms of <coughs> standardised tests. Um, so it, within this culture of compliance, um, te teachers are, are also coping with a, a, a national curriculum and the pressure to teach STEM education um, in, a, in a way that's um, inquiry-based learning, so which, which takes time um, and is difficult, yet a whole system revolves around the, um, the end of year 12 exams that, get, that, that um, build up a score that allows for university entrance and so on. So there's a, there's a few conflicting um, issues that teachers have to face in their working life. In the literature, you'll hear of professional development as 
sort of hit and run and drive by and spray on those kinds of metaphors that are used for professional learning that teaches uh, professional development that teachers get. And and while I think that I better define what I mean, um, professional development. I, I guess means what what um, activities, um, uh, workshops or programs or um, conferences and things that people go to. Professional learning is is what what the teachers gain from it in terms of increasing their knowledge or changing their practice, changing their beliefs, um, and those sorts of things. Okay, so within that context, I then had to think about, well, how would my research study, how would my PhD evolve? And I had no idea, really. I, um, I worked, taught maths and science in, in the classroom for over 20 years, so I didn't come from the background of academia. And my background is in science and maths education, and before that I, I worked in some science research. So I was very familiar with the, the process of, of scientific, scientific method and positivism and, and, and um, that type of research. And then, so I had to think, I had to think a lot about, well, what do I really want to do? And my, my supervisor said over and over and over for week after week after week, what do you want to do? Why do you want to do it? How are you going to do it? And then there was this, so what, so what, so what, time after time after time. And that was so good because it really did make me think, um, <laughs> so what, about what I was going to do. And really at the heart of it is I wanted to talk to teachers about what they felt, you know, what they were going through, what they were thinking. Um, I, didn't, I didn't want to count how many times they visited Facebook or, or count how many times they um, uploaded a, a power, you know, a, a lesson plan or I didn't want those kinds of measurements. I wanted to hear about their experiences so that those experiences could be shared amongst other teachers. And it really stems back to my experience as a teacher. Um, when we used to start a new topic, I used to, let's say we were adding fractions. I'd say to my students, well, here's a, here's a particular um, uh, calculation. Go ahead and do it. And then I'd get the students to come back and tell the class or show us all how they did it. And year after year after year, the same three or four different ways of solving a problem would come up. That will be slightly different in terms of, um, um, you know, the examples they chose and, and the words they used and this and that. But basically it was the same kind of thing. They'd, they'd draw things, they'd guess things, they'd work it out off the top of their head, they'd model something. Um, so th there was basically the same the same pattern emerged year after year after year. And by sharing students sharing their experiences with each other, it actually helped their learning. You'd see children say, oh, wow, that's how you did it. Great, I'll try that. So they learned from each other by, by sharing what they did. So that's the kind of thing I was interested in. Um, what were teachers doing on the open web? And what were the different things that they were doing so that we could learn about those differences? And so my, my supervisor finally got it out of me that it was, what, it was their perspective I wanted. Um, so it was the qualitative study that, that I was after and that's what I ended up doing. Um, I'm going to get you to do a little thing now. Just you've, you've all seen this before, the vase. What do you see first up when you see that vase? Could you just type into the chat? <laughs> When you, what do you see? I shouldn't have said that vase. What do you see when you look at it straight off? Faces? <laughs> Trophy and faces. So, 
seems to be more faces than, than the bars. Okay, so what do you actually, so you can see that there are two ways of experiencing that image. You can see it as a bar or you can see it as two faces. So we see it differently. But what are some of the things that, what are the, so the meaning of that, that image is, it has, it has two different meanings, maybe three because someone see, sees uh, almost, people almost kissing each other. Okay, so maybe three. So can you tell me in the chat, what are the features, what, what is the structure or, or features or characteristics that, that you notice? What are some of the things about that image that you notice? So what is it about the face? Well, I can see a nose. Yeah, you can see it's black and white. Yeah, so Carolyn's face, nose, mouth, black and white, facial features and so on, yes. Okay, so the, the front and the head, black and white. Yes, yeah, so what I'm getting at there is that that, that image was experienced in two ways, but people focused on different things, different aspects of, of the vase in order to give them that meaning. I just want to give you another very quick example just to scale it up a bit. Can you write down in the chat um, an experience of using um, an open education resource? What do open education resources, OERs, mean to you? Could you just write that down in the text? OER. Open Education Resources, Access. Freedom. Okay, Adaption, Collaborating Agency. There's a lot of different meanings coming through. Okay, so, you know, when you read, read, read through the literature, you, you see all of these things. Just recently there's been um, self as OER, which is something that I find really interesting. So it's practical things like access, um, textbooks, and then you've got things like agency and the social aspects of collaboration. Okay, so so there's a lot of different meanings. So then, can you can you think about well, what is it about the OERs that that give that kind of meaning to you? So that they're the kind of characteristics or what I call structural aspects of of the experience of using an OER. So what is it about the OER? that gives that meaning of sharing, for example. <laughs> this is when we get into difficult. Yeah, okay, so, uh, so I guess the people behind it, so, yeah, funding, intention, openness, I, uh, so I guess we're, we're talking about a, um, an ethic or a, um, an ethos, purpose, licenses. Okay, there's this. So you could probably get a little bit of an idea about this is what I mean by experience. So when I talk about experience, I don't just mean what what's filling up in your head. You know, you're very experienced researchers. You've got lots of knowledge. But experience in, in the context of my study works two ways. And I use the example to, to my kids that, it, that if I, I've never been bungee jumping, but people who go bungee jumping, they experience it um, as a frightening, terrifying or exhilarating or a mixture of everything. It has an effect on them. But the characteristics or the, the features or the structure of that experience might mean ropes, um, speed, 
the day of the week, um, you know, all, all sorts of other things. So experience has two aspects to it. It's about the effect that it has on you and it's about the characteristics or the structure of that experience. So it is, it's, re, it's a relational thing. I'm not talking about what's just going on in your head. I'm not talking about what's going on in, 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 in the environment where your experience is situated. I'm talking about that space in between. So it's, it's, it's experience is a twofold, a two-part thing. And then if you toss in Dewey's um, uh, theoretical aspects as well, it also has um, continuity and um, um, impact as, as well. Uh, so moving on from that, so the next thing for me was, well, I kind of knew what, kind of, what, what sort of study I wanted to do. I wanted to ask teachers about their experiences of learning on the open web. I was going to ask them questions. I wanted to find out about well, what, what aspects or what features of the open web made their experiences meaningful. But I read so many books, right? It wasn't just a scientific method anymore. It was, you know, pretty much go and do what you like. And I couldn't cope with that. I really, I really fell into a heap. So I had to press pause and go off and do a course on uh, research methods in, in the social sciences because I, I didn't know anything about it. Um, it was really enjoyable. I, I learned a lot, but in a way it confused me even more. So I've been fairly confused for a couple of years until I came across this, this particular book on qualitative research design. And to me it spoke of, it, it, it made what I, what I felt was very complex um, field. It, it sort of pulled all, all the different um, types of qualitative studies or approaches together and has picked out the commonalities to all of those and put it in a framework that, that I found it easy to work within. So Carolyn, you've used this before. Has anyone else used, used this fellow? Um, I think it was, I, I tweeted at one of the chapters uh, a couple of months ago and I think that's what, what put me onto it. So originally it was uh, a, something I picked up on Twitter and I thought oh, I really relate to this um, because it, it's, it's just, it speaks to me. So the rest of my presentation is going to be based on research design and one of, one of the reasons why I've chosen to do this is because I'm learning heaps because I'm supposed to be writing about this now. But also I figured that maybe it, um, others may benefit from it too. So a good design, and, and in all the other books I've read about, I've read, I read about theoretical frameworks, um, what are the other frameworks, design frameworks, um, you know, so many, so many frameworks. Um, uh, it's very confusing. So research, so research design, it has brings com certain components together to work in a harmonious way. So I see my, my PhD as the whole thing and made up of certain components that are all related to each other. And this is basically what Maxwell's design, design is based on five fundamental aspects that are, that are flexible. So if you see the whole thing is your PhD, um, then you've got five aspects of it and those aspects are all related. And if you can imagine all those, he, he, Maxwell talks about the arrows could possibly be elastic bands. So if you if you pull too hard on one end, the rest of the things jiggle around a bit, but they're still there and they still move with the pressure that's put on one of those aspects. But if there's too much pressure or if it's too incongruous or if things don't work together, then one of those elastic bands will snap and your research design falls in a heap 
and you've got to start again. So it's a flexible design. It's interconnected and it's flexible, but it's not linear. But you'll notice that in the centre are the research questions that are related to every other aspect of your framework. They don't guide every aspect of your framework because what I'm finding is my research questions are actually shifting and they continue to... The fundamental aspect of the study hasn't, but wording has. And the goals shift a bit. And the conceptual framework, that's the big headache, that one, that's shifting all the time. Um, and, and the methods and the trustworthiness. So they're all interrelated, but they can snap and fall apart if you don't get them all relating to each other in a meaningful way. Does anyone want to ask anything or, or say anything? Because it's half past. Does that make sense to you or do you want to stop and ask any question at the moment? Oh, good. So Caroline's still there. Are you still really confused about what sort of frameworks to use? Because you find it, depending on the book that you read, um, Authors or some people seem to have their pet ways or, or their favourite ways of saying something. And then you think you've just got a handle on it and then you go and read another book and you're thinking, well, they're talking about the same thing but it means something else. Or they're, they're saying it in a different way. And it's so, so terribly confusing. Yeah, pick one and stick to it. I have now been. I'm not changing. Jenny stopped reading. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a common problem. And so, but but you see, this is something I didn't realise at the beginning that that a framework or a PhD does have this kind of flexibility built into it. And um, I was thinking in a very linear, very structured, very do this, this, and this, like a bit of you know, if you're going to go and make a sponge cake, you have to do it all perfectly, otherwise it's a flop. Well, it's not like that. You can you can play around with it, but but within the constraints of the whole framework. No recipes, no. Okay, so I'm within the context of this framework. I'm going. I've, I've even color coded a little bit, and this this is I've sort of written part of part of my PhD doing this presentation. So here we go. See goals are blue. So we've got blue. So my goals, well, well, Maxwell divides the goals thing up into three major areas and I'd really appreciate your input here if you think that we can add to it or take away from it. So you've got personal goals, which um, I'm not going to avoid because I think they're an important aspect of, of a study because I haven't been slotted into a a research project, so I was allowed to do what I wanted to do. So basically, I, I had a, 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 I really loved learning on the open web, what I now called open education. Because after I left the classroom, I was playing around on the open web for a couple of years. I did some online teaching. Um, <laughs> I did a lot of MOOCs. I met a, quite a number of people who are who are here tonight. Um, I was a real mookaholic for a while and I blogged away and I did all sorts of things and I just loved loved the kind of learning that I had exposure to on the open web, which I now realise is called open education. And as a result of that, I Um, and then, then I realised that I was getting really meaningful professional learning from this. I was learning so much about STEM education, how, how the, um, the curriculum was changing, how our, our expectations were changing. And there was a lot of, a lot of discussion happening about, um, where have you gone? Oh, Helen, where have I gone? I'm still here, Helen. Um, so... Also, I bring to this study, I believe, um, insight. Um, you know, we hear about this argument about our theory 
theory never reaches the classroom, teachers are never interested in theory and there's this big, big gap that's getting wider and wider. Um, and that's another reason why that the kids aren't learning enough maths and science because teachers aren't reading enough theory and, and on and on it goes. So I believe I, I bring to this study some insight about what it's like to be a teacher. But I'm also very aware that, that, that what used to be called bias or what you, what's called bias, um, my subjective experience could interfere with, with the research. And so um, ways to deal with that are built into the whole design. <clears throat> but you have to be explicit about what you're doing in order to counteract um, your subjective experience in this area. There are practical goals as well. Um, I've just put the one main one there is is I'd like to be able to to recommend some an, a, a meaningful alternative to professional learning for Australian teachers learning about STEM education. I'm not quite sure what that will be yet, whether it will be design principles or a, or a framework or or something like that. And then there's then Maxwell talked about the scholarly input. So being a PhD, it, you know. You've got to move it up a notch a bit and think about well what what contribution to theory can I make? Um, well, this is a hard one, but I think it's the understanding of experience and meaning, but um, in terms of open education. And um, through the lenses of phenomenography and transformative learning theory. Um, a lot of people talk about uh, transformation, disruption, all that sort of thing, um, but it's not often in the context of adult learning theory, which is transformative learning theory, which is a, a large body of research that in the field of adult education. And there's not, not a great deal of overlapping between the area of areas of professional learning and adult education. Or adult learning. So I'm bringing those two aspects together. And maybe I wasn't sure about the last bit. Other people might help me out here, but is there much theoretical development of open education yet? I've, I've, I've seen I've seen some really interesting papers, but um, when you talk about theory. Um, Maxwell talks about well, just sort of conceptual linking or, or the linking together or finding relationships between concepts. Um, not really. Yeah. How am I going to communicate this to the body of teachers? Uh, well, that's a good thing. After my PhD is done, um, I'm not. I'm not quite sure. Well, I'll, I'll tweet it. I'll put it that. I'll put it out on the open web. And um, if someone gives me a job, maybe I could go around and talk to teachers about it. Who knows? Some, something might happen. At the moment, I'm working full time on my PhD. I don't want to go back into the classroom as a classroom teacher, but there may be maybe some potential to do that later on. And Caroline, this work builds, builds on um, a large body of, of work in um, teach, learning and teaching as well. Uh, it's an open ed and ed tech under theorised, not critical. Yes, that's for another webinar. Communicate to normal people. Okay, B, you doing that one? Yeah. <laughs> um, so they're the goals, and so I've got too much, too many slides for this presentation that all revolve around that framework. So we, you may want to guide me as to what aspects of the framework you'd like to talk about. Um, there's a lot on the conceptual framework and there's too much text here but um, I, I can just, I might just give, give you a minute rather than talking just if, you, if you'd like to read through that slide. Thanks Amanda, I'd, I'd really like to look at Bonnie's presentation. Yeah. 
So the conceptual framework aspect of this model, and I'll, I'll just go back to the research design model again. The conceptual framework um, matches with your goals. So you, you, you have your goals and then, then um, you begin to look at all of the concepts related to those goals and how all of those concepts then relate to each other. Um, I haven't I haven't put in a um, I, I still have to do that yet. Um, I guess uh, concept mapping or word clouds and, and things like that. Um, I really still have to do that yet. Anyway, so the conceptual framework is what concepts? So like with me it's uh, um, experience, meaning, openness, adult education, learning, so many of them. Um, assumptions, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that uh, in my study, an assumption in phenomenography is that teachers will learn, all have a different experience of, of a professional learning session. They don't all experience, someone comes and delivers a, a session to you, blah, 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 it's been planned, it's been delivered, but what teachers learn from that session will vary from person to person. So that's one assumption. Um, so all those kinds of things, your expectations, beliefs, different theories and so on, and, what, and how do they all relate to each other? And as soon as you start relating them to each other, you're starting to build up, you're starting to theorise about the phenomenon you're interested in, and I'm interested in professional learning through open education. So my, my research problem is, well, in the literature it's reported that teachers um, are not finding their professional learning effective enough or meaningful enough, fragmented, disconnected um, and irrelevant to the realities of classroom practice, especially since we now have a national curriculum which is pushing STEM education. So it's, a, it's quite a different um, curriculum and way of teaching that some teachers are asked to do. Um, so that's my problem and it is a problem because it's known, we know through research that what you believe, your beliefs impact on your practice and we know from research, that, especially Hattie's research, that while students are at school, the, 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 the um, aspect that has the greatest influence on their learning is the teacher, but that's while they're at school. And I haven't been able to find any research about the meaning teachers uh, give to their experiences of professional learning through open education. Um, and this is why, what I call on my network. If you find anything, please let, that, let me know. That would be good. Um, Caroline, that's an important point. Yeah, communicate your findings. Yes, absolutely. Um, Catherine, There's a few of those I haven't come across, Catherine, so thank you. Thank you, that's good. Um, and so the, 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 the philosophical and the methodological paradigm, you know, all those um, uh, ologies, those words that used to give me nightmares, um, uh, is relational. So I'm, um, it's not, I'm not, relational means you're not, you're not talking about what's what's the cognitive aspects of teachers' learning or the situate, situative aspects. It's it's what what happens in between. So you're relating what's happening to the teacher to what they're doing. Um, so it actually links the two, which which gives you more information about their experience, and it's interpretive. Um, oh, it's quarter two. I better hurry up. So. So really, to build your, your conceptual framework, you can use your, um, Max will suggest using your experiential knowledge. So I've, I've been writing a reflective journal all the way through and creating memos on every step of the way, which can be used to, to inform, you know, to help me link together those concepts, um, to, to theorise. Um, 
my literature review, what I've learned from existing theory and, and research. So when I talk about transformative learning, I'm, I'm building upon that large area of research in adult learning, um, but also on open education and professional learning. And I'm using phenomenography, which, which enables me to look at teachers' experience, but um, split that experience up into what it means to the teachers and then what they're aware of or what they focus on. So it takes experience one step further. So um, the, I know I didn't realise that this, but Maxwell suggests that you can put your pilot study and into the conceptual framework, which I did. So I piloted the, um, the survey I did and thank you to the... Um, um, oh, I've had a mental block. B, your surveys that are out there on the open. Um, the research hub, the OE at the hub. That's right. And I didn't pinch them, I borrowed them and I have acknowledged them in my PhD, but I, um, I framed some of my questions on, on some OER Hub research um, questions, which are great. They are CC and I use them it's like that. So I'm glad I did that survey and it was essential to do that because I know from my experience on the open web that teachers are engaged in open educational practices. They share, they communicate, they build on each other's work, they do all of those sorts of things, but they they didn't recognise those terms in the survey. So um, I was able to see what they were doing and what language that would be appropriate for my interview. Because in a phenomenographic interview, every person has to start on the same page. We're talking about a phenomenon that has to be this mean the same thing to everybody at the beginning. You know, if you're, going to, if you're going to find out people's experiences of bungee jumping, they all need to know what that is. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. And thought experiments. I didn't know what a thought experiment was. And then, then I was thinking, well, I do a lot of thinking and writing and connecting up of things. And that's what you do in in vivo. Um, <clears throat> the in vivo, the, the, um, the digital program for, for coding, um, what do you call it? I just had a mental block. Um, yeah, that, those linkages, the software, that's it. <laughs> um, it helps you to keep track of those links and the original source of, of um, what, what you're trying to link together. So I better hurry up here. Um, I don't have to talk about all these slides, as I said before. Um, That one. So just by, just very quickly, phenomenography is is different to um, phenom phenomenology, um, um, and I can't tell you about that because I, I don't really know a great deal about it. I, I just know that with phenomenography, um, I'm not looking for the essence of professional learning on the open web. I'm looking at variation of experience the different experiences. Uh, it is an empirical research method, qualitative, um, that relational view of the world, focusing on experience and variation of experience and second order perspective. So I'm not asking teachers, um, you know, what, what to actually describe just to tell me literally what they did. I'm asking teachers about their experience of something the effect it had on had on them, what it meant to them, what, what they're learning they gained from that. And so that little diagram there, you can see it situates the researcher, the subjects, which are the teachers, and the phenomenon, which is professional learning through open education. And what I'm interested in, the object of my study, is that relationship between the two, to be able to link X to Y, so to speak. What the, sub, what the meaning of something to the subjects and what they actually did. But I have to be careful that, that me as a researcher, my understanding of the phenomenon doesn't interfere with that. 
or my relationship with the subject doesn't interfere with that. So that's where the ethics comes in and, and so on. Um, uh, another reason why I was attracted to phenomenography because it builds on an extensive research base into learning and teaching and a lot of it has been in, in the higher education sector so you've probably all heard about your deep and surface learning, conversational framework, silo taxonomy. I was really surprised, I didn't, didn't realise how extensive it was but it underpins a lot um, a lot of other other work that goes way back to the to the seventies. So there's a lot to to work from that. Caroline, you've mentioned Chrissy. She's I think she's defending her PhD this week too. So um, yeah, Friday. I'll be thinking of her on Friday. So off to the research questions. So back to the framework. So I'm getting to my research questions now, and I just have to be very quick. Um, so these are changing all the time. The wording is changing. What I have done hasn't, you know, I've, I've done it all. But so really um, the main question is how do Australian teachers experience professional learning through open education in the context of STEM education? So I'm looking at well, what does it mean to the teachers and then what do they focus on? What are they aware of? Because they're aware of different things and different things have different meaning. And there's another question that I want to put in there but I don't know how to put it there. It's about bringing in transformative learning theory into this because it's I, I want to find out which aspects of experience resulted in the transformative learning because there was a number of teachers whose experiences were their, their, their whole world view on how to use the open web changed what they were doing. Um, so I'm still still working on something there. A sub question. So with the method, well how can I explore that um, from the perspective of the teachers? Well I go and ask them. That's what I had to do. And the, one, of, one of the assumptions, and there are others, is that they experience professional learning differently. So I'm, I'm after, even, the, even if you ask, like I asked you all about you before, how you experience open education resources, and you, and if, if I was to sort of code all of those responses, there'd be, there'd, there'd be certain um, experiences that were prob could probably be scaled up to you know, to a much larger group. Um, done that, done that. So with the methods, who did I ask? Well, Australian teachers. The reason why I chose, um, narrowed it down to teachers learning about STEM education is because that's my background in, in science and maths education. So that helped me to narrow down the, the um, sample. So it was purpose, pur purposeful sampling. Um, I did it online. I distributed um, a request. Uh, after I got my ethics, I distributed the request and um, did it in Qualtrics. And I did that last year. Um, the survey, I collected demographic data um, and then I had to develop what, what's called a contextualising statement in phenomenography where you, you basically read the same statement at the beginning of every interview to make sure that, that the researcher and the, and the participants were talking about the same thing. And with the open web and OERs and all that kind of thing, it was really difficult. So I couldn't talk about open educational practices because it didn't have much meaning. I couldn't, couldn't talk about open educational resources because it didn't have much meaning. So I talked about their learning on the open web. So they had, access, they had to have internet access. Um, um, and so, yeah, so, so we, worked, we worked around those, those communication, those um, wording those problems of wording and terms. Semi-structured interviews, open-ended questions, lots of 
no input, no extra input from me apart from my questions and I was able to probe the participants as they came in with their responses in order to elicit more information. Data analysis, well, that, that would be another presentation in itself, but it's very similar, I read, to grounded theory in that you're, it's inductive, it's iterative. I didn't, I didn't have um, themes in order to put, put the meanings under. You know, I had to, the, the meaning had to emerge from the data. Um, and so on, so and that's still going. I kept, I'll, I'll be revisiting that right to the end because so the data analysis hasn't finished yet. Um, and, and therefore, these findings are only tentative. Um, yeah, Jenny, they they have for some it was really obvious right from the beginning. Um, so the findings, these, these are what are what called categories of description. So I had 500 pages of, trans, I transcribed the interviews for about, you know, word for word, had about 500 pages um, and then I had to go through them all and thank you Catherine, thank you so much for coming along. Um, I had about 35 different meanings which I then condensed down to these one, two, these um, six, basically, and um, and these will, will probably change. But with phenomenography, the it um, the like the last one will include all the ones before it. So. Um, you know, te teachers used the open web to learn because it suited them. You know, they could learn what they wanted, when they wanted, where they wanted. Um, they had control. Um, when they had problems in their working environment, they used the open web. They're learning on the open web to sort out their problems. So they had a lot of a lot of agency. What's that? Can I ask? Why did you put the label of agency? Um, it's just a very um, it's it's a lot broader than need, needs and wants, but um, and these these headings I have I haven't finalised yet. But Caroline, I guess what I was I was trying to with agency. Um, it's a funny kind of word because it has different meanings depending on the literature you read. But um, they they're using the environment of the open web to to sort out the problems they face or, or gain the learning they need and then that feeds back into the environment that, that they have and, and they share it with other people. So there is it, there is a lot more to um, agency than just needs and wants. Um, I'll, I actually forgot to, I've got a list of the literature I've used which I haven't attached to this so I'll have to give it to B tomorrow. Um, and so, so people can see that. Do you have a place where the GOGN can put our references be? That would be something we could do. Um, so the role of the social wasn't important to everybody. It was important to some, but there were quite a few teachers who just used the open web for, for they didn't want to get involved in the social aspects. They just wanted to learn and lurking. A lot of people were learning by just watching and what other people were doing. I don't have time to go through all of these, but um, I'll, just, I'll just leave that there because um, I'm mindful of the time. So trustworthiness, that's another part of the framework. How might I be wrong? And one of the reasons why this presentation is so good because you are my first critical audience. So the credibility of this work um, is, is it, partially helped by how I communicate it and whether it makes sense to you. Um, whether, I'm argue, whether I'm arguing persuasively, but I don't have time to do all of that now. Um, so it's trustworthiness, rigor in trustworthiness, something that I'm interested in, but there are other aspects too. Um, and Limitations, there are the, the usual limitations of a small study. I interviewed 20 teachers 
um, was very, it doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a lot of, a lot of data to analyse. And the theory in phenomenography is if, if I interviewed 40 or 60, I would probably see the same um, general themes of, of experience. Um, can't be generalised. But possibly can within the large audience of oh, who knows I can't I can't make any statements like that yet. Um, but they but it does build on all all the other studies of phenomenography and transformative learning that that's there already. And then my faculties are still in store. So this is just a lovely gem. I love I love the images. But I ran out of time to find out more in, images. So I just like this one because it's compartmentalised. Um, I think that was the science of phrenology or something where they theorised about the bumps on your skull. They figured that underneath that bump, that those bumps were responsible for certain um, aspects of your brain. <laughs> okay, so that, that's all. Um, a big thank you to the Global Network for having me on and to the wonderful teachers that I um, interviewed, to my supervisors, the network, my PLN and my university. So thank you, B. There's one minute to go. That's all. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it feels like we need another webinar with you so that you can go into like, you know, more detail and all that stuff. So. We still, oh. we still have, we can, I mean, I know it's already 1 p.m. in the UK, so it's 10 p.m. In, in Australia, so um, we have time for one question, if anyone has a pressing question, there was somebody on the chat saying, uh, if you can share the slide, so would you put them on a, if you put them on a, on your slide, um, on your, which slide was it? So your slide, the presentation, if we could, if you if if we could um share them. Oh absolutely. Um I'm happy I'm happy to tweet but I'd I'd like to put a license on them. B? Yeah. Um so, so you what, what do you normally do with what do you normally do with participants slides? Um they normally put them I normally they put them on their own slide share account. Whatever it is that they, they normally do since, if they don't have a place to put them, then there is a GoGN account that, that, that we can use. Um, so if you, whatever you put them, if you send me the link, then what I'll do is I'll send it to everyone who was, who was, um, who was here this morning or this, this evening or tonight. Um, and I will also include a link on your blog post, basically. And also, you know, mm -hmm. when I point people to the recording, there'll be a link there also to if you could watch your slides. Um, but it's entirely up to you. I mean, yes, by all means, you know, it, they have to be read. They have to be ready for sharing. Open sharing. Or open. Yes. If you would say, if you're like, yeah. If you like to think which you're comfortable sharing or which you're not comfortable sharing. Um, I'm. I'm I'm comfortable sharing um, on the open. I just, I'll just get my supervisors to. Um, I'm sure. I mean, I'm sure there's not an issue. I, I would just like to put a Creative Commons license of some sort onto them before I put them out there. Um, yeah, I, um, Helen, I did get. I did get Maxwell. I did. I got it as an ebook. Um, I'm using it on um, Kindle. Kindle book. Yeah. I mean, I can. I'm happy to stay on for a few more minutes. Um, it's up to you, B. I can say, we still have, in terms of the online space, we still have another ten minutes. So if anyone has has a like a question, we are happy to stay for a little longer. If not, I say goodbye to everybody. So any questions coming from the floor? Thanks, Jenny. Um, Matissa had a question about maybe a remark is existing a similar research about closed education resources. Um, 
Yeah, well, there's there's not really a it's not really a focus on resources as such. Um, it the focus of my my research is on experience um, rather than resources. So unless you're talking about um, so like experiences of teachers who are learning on on the web but in closed spaces only. Somebody is saying. Thanks, Helen. Bye. Sorry, somebody is saying. Would you would you tell me more about your method of data analysis? Data analysis. Um. Amanda. Oh, Amanda. Amanda, are you doing phenomenography? How far are you with your with your study? Ah. <laughs> um, I, it's it's really difficult because there's no sort of methods out there as such. Um, Amanda, maybe we could just get together for. It would help me too because I need. We lost you momentarily. Yeah. Um, Matissa said, if I understand correctly, you have focus on experience, on open training. No, it's not. Um, I actually, I didn't, I didn't actually mention the word self-directed. Um, Matissa, there's no, no training as such. The teachers are just. Um, hang, like hanging out on the open web and doing their own thing. So it's, it's self-directed. It's not a, not they're not doing a course, or they they might actually be doing a MOOC or something as part of their experience. It's it's what what they actually learn by doing whatever they want to do. Um, they're just directing it themselves. Amanda, that would be fine. Um, are you on Twitter, or, or how can we connect? Okay, and I'm I'm at. Um, thanks, thanks, Matusa. Yeah, so let's connect and we can have a chat. That would be good. Okay, so I think we need we we really need to wrap it up now because uh, one people are disappearing and uh, it's it's getting late for everyone. So awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I, I always say with this webinar, I, I'm always left with um, wanting to know more, which I think it's, 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 it's always a good thing. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you everyone for coming. And thank you, Penny, for, for sharing your, your research with us. Uh, thanks so much. A pleasure. Thanks. It was good. I'm relaxed now. <laughs> <laughs>